Imagine growing up poor and unexpectedly inheriting a billion dollars. What would you do with it? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. Today we are exploring the home of William Coe in Oyster Bay, New York. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. In the 1880s, when William Coe was just a teenager, his family emigrated to the New World from England. His father supported all ten of his children by working as a cashier near Philadelphia while living in New Jersey. When William turned 15 years old, he set out to find a job in Philadelphia near his father and was hired by a successful insurance broker to do all the errands around the office. As the years went by and he began to learn about the inner workings of insurance, he was promoted to various positions. Then, when Johnson & Higgins Insurance Company bought out the company he was working for, William was promoted to the role of manager and sent off to New York City to manage the adjusting department. He fell in love for the first time and married Jane Fallingant, but she passed away only a few short years later. In 1900, following her death, William decided to take a trip back to England while he grieved. But just as fate would have it, he met his second wife, May Rogers. May was the daughter of oil baron, Henry H. Rogers, who had amassed a fortune while working with Standard Oil. For the first time, he was exposed to a life he never knew existed. May frequented balls at palaces around the world, and when the two returned to New York City, he found himself rubbing shoulders with high society. Of course, no son-in-law of an oil baron could continue working in middle management. The family pulled some strings, and by 1910, William had been named the president of the Johnsons and Higgins Insurance Company and was placed on the board of directors at the Virginian Railway. However, with the higher level job title came more responsibility. Back at Johnson's and Higgins, he personally took on his most infamous account, ensuring the unsinkable RMS Titanic. The Titanic embarked on its maiden journey, striking an iceberg and sinking. On board were several of his new friends and family through his wife. Of the 1,500 people who lost their lives that day, Many were captains of industry, barons, and tycoons. This caused a massive transfer of wealth as their estates were divided amongst their heirs. May Rogers was one such trustee, receiving large sums of money through deceased family. The young couple now had serious cash to burn. In 1913, they headed out to Long Island, New York to purchase Upper Planting Fields Farm, an estate which boasted expansive botanical gardens. The original house mysteriously burned down, and the insurance claim, through Johnson & Higgins Insurance Company, paid for it to be replaced by a sprawling 67-room mansion. They hired the architecture firm of Walker & Gillette to design for them a Tudor Revival-style palace to be faced in Indiana limestone with artisan terracotta accents along its many prominent chimneys. The stonework featured intricate and ornate details while the half-timbered sections boasted wooden busts extending from corbels. The mansion known as Coe Hall was to stand out proudly above the perfectly curated gardens designed in part by the Olmsted brothers. More than 10,000 species of flowers, trees, and bushes were planted along trails and streams throughout the 400-plus acre estate. Approaching the entry, we will pass below stone relief work and continue through the iron and wooden doors to arrive in the entry corridor. Upon entering the home, our eyes are directed down the long, wide corridor flanked with thin stone pilasters supporting heavy stone arches. First, we will step into the reception room, off to the side, to be welcomed by a springtime assortment of cheerful greens and yellows decorating the wood-paneled walls. Directly above us, a crystal chandelier reflects light to illuminate the hand-stenciled floral motif of the cornice. Next, we will return to the entry hall and wind our way through the shadows to find the dining room furniture appearing silhouetted by the sunlight penetrating the hall. As we continue our approach, the room opens up as light pours in from two directions, allowing us to see the lively colors of the Persian rug and feel the warmth of old-growth wood beams coffering the ceiling. We will continue our tour to the gallery, where European tapestries and trophies decorate the walls below a vaulted ceiling joining on Gothic pointed arches. The Great Hall, with half-height bookshelves, 
is interrupted by the windows, limestone mullions, below a playful ceiling displaying a banner of geometric designs complemented by exposed fluted beams. After winding through colonnades decorated with elaborate fretwork, we will find the reading room, offering a quiet retreat where William collected Americana in the form of letters and journals from early American settlers and pioneers. For more serious matters, including discussing business, the study could accommodate a small group for a private conversation. After making our way up the stairs, we can continue down the second floor corridor to find the bedrooms. William's bedroom was finished out in layers of floral textiles, with heavy and overstuffed furniture covering the floors. May's bedroom was considerably less cluttered, with light, dainty furniture sparingly placed about so as to not distract from the elaborate wall murals and the delicately stenciled ceiling. Of the many guest rooms in the mansion, perhaps you would be assigned to this one, with half-timbered walls and a large bay window. The couple lived happily in the house until 1924, when May unexpectedly passed away. Over the next couple of years, William became enamored with breeding and racing horses, adding state-of-the-art stables to the property. By 1937, he had competed with six different horses in the Kentucky Derby, earning second place in the races. In his later years, he began to reflect on his success in life and to give back through charitable donations. He established American Studies programs at 40 universities, both public and private. He then headed out west to Wyoming, where he purchased a ranch and made significant donations. He opened hospitals, donated artwork, paved streets, and built Co Hall at the University of Wyoming. Finally, in 1949, he deeded Co Hall to the state of New York with a hefty endowment. His former estate was to be open to the public as the Planting Fields Arboretum and the historic gardens were to continue being cared for. A few years later, in 1955, he passed away while vacationing at his beach house in Palm Beach, Florida. To this day, most of the colleges he donated to have continued building on their American Studies programs. As for Planting Fields Arboretum, it remains open to the public, preserved as a time capsule both inside and out, where visitors can fully immerse themselves in a beautiful, bygone era. Which part of William Coe's estate did you like the best? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a very special thank you to our This House supporters, whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on this screen and contribute in part to the production of these videos, join our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.